Uh, good morning uh, to everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you may be joining us from today. We'd like to welcome, welcome you and thank you for attending this webinar session of day one, validating, optimizing, and monitoring EO sterilization processes. This webinar is aimed at providing medical device companies the opportunity to establish or refresh uh, your fundamental testing knowledge and thereby achieve more efficient, accurate, and effective testing outcomes. Here to present this session today is Dania Cortez and Courtney Lang, our resident experts at Nelson Laboratories. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, if you missed one of our webinars or or you need to leave early and you want to refer back to this uh, webinar or any other uh, webinars, you can always find them on the Nelson Labs website on the on-demand webinars page listed under education about a week after the event. Also, Nelson Labs and our sister company, Sterigenics, often host three-day medical device educational seminars where we get to dive deeper into many different topics. Uh, we hope to start resuming those uh, live in-person events when it is safe. Uh, you can find out more information about these events on the news and events page under the seminars tab. You can also receive these notifications of events as, uh, as well as any other information regarding testing, sterilization, biocompatibility, packaging, and other news updates by liking Nelson Labs, or Sterogenics on Facebook, or following on Twitter and LinkedIn. Now, as for this webinar, we welcome all your questions, and you can submit them many times during uh, this event. Uh, Danny and Courtney will try to answer as many as possible during the last 10 to 15 minutes of this session. Uh, we do ask that if you have a product-specific question, that you write it down and contact Danny or Courtney after the event. Now, let me just give you a little bit of introduction to Dania and Courtney. Dania is the Director of Lab Operations over the Sterilization Department at Nelson Labs. She brings in 19 years of experience in the medical device industry, and she has spent the last 12 years in the ethylene oxide department as a study director over the, the EO product resistance and feasibility studies, and as a lab manager, ensuring uh, services were in pair with the latest industry standards. Courtney is the Senior Laboratory Operations Manager of the Sterilization Section at Nelson Labs, and she has spent the last decade helping medical device manufacturers validate the processes used to terminally sterilize their products using ethylene oxide. She has helped uh, companies with all their sterilization needs, starting from the initial exploration into the modality during functionality and feasibility testing through process challenge device and cycle development activities and validation, as well as providing continued support during routine uh, production. We would now like, I'd like to now turn the time over to Dania and Courtney. The time is now yours. Thank you, Mike, and welcome everybody. It is 30 degrees up here in Salt Lake City, Utah. If you don't, uh, that's 30 degrees Fahrenheit. If you don't like Fahrenheit, it's about minus one degree Celsius. Uh, it's, it's a little sunny with some clouds in the sky, so it's a beautiful day. We want to welcome you to the validating, optimizing, and monitoring your ethylene oxide sterilization process webinar. We, we're going to be covering different aspects of the sterilization process using ethylene oxide, and we are going to emphasize some certain activities that are hoping to help you um, to optimize your cycles or to develop new and efficient cycles. Um, I have Courtney with me, so we're gonna go together on this down this path and, and, and try to help answer as many questions as you might have at the end of the webinar. Um, this webinar is, is a two-day webinar. Today, and this is the agenda, today we're going to focus on, on on different activities that can be performed before a cycle has been validated. In fact, they will need to be performed before a cycle has been validated. If the cycle already has been validated, that doesn't mean that you can change certain things and still be within that initial validation. Um, but if you are just about to develop a new cycle, um, day one is for you. 
And if you already have validated a cycle and you're looking to optimize it, optimize it, our sterogenics experts, Mike Dill and Ross Grogowski, are going to help with that on day two. They're gonna talk about cycle optimization next Thursday on day two of this webinar. So if you haven't registered, just take a minute to do so and don't miss on this opportunity. Again, they're gonna talk about how to optimize a, a current cycle. Now, I do, I do wanna take a couple of minutes to, to, for us to understand where in the process um, the contents of this webinar are taking place. So on the slide, you are looking at, um, um, and I'm gonna get my pointer here. Um, you're looking at, at, dif at the different stages, different steps that you have to take to validate a sterilization process. And it, everything starts with the manufacturing at your own facility and it goes all the way to um, after validation and after you have defined the cycle, um, at the end you are end up monitoring and maintaining your process efficiency uh, and effectiveness. So um, what are we gonna, the, the, the things that we're gonna talk about today are taking place on mainly on these two phases of your validation road. That is on the process definition, this is where you select your PCDs, this is where you establish your load. Um, a little bit on the product definition, right? But um, PCD selection is really important and, and that's, that's at this step. And then we'll move on to the validation phase. Um, this is where we'll talk about the, the alternative ways of validating a cycle um, other than the overkill cycle and this and that's the, this too. So um, this is again, just a, a big overview of, of where we're gonna be focusing on today. Now, um, let's start here. We're gonna start on, on, on a little bit on, on product development and, and the process development. And that we're, we're gonna start on, on selecting the best packaging and the best effective load configuration. So when you're moving down the road, um, you, you don't have any issues with these two aspects. Uh, believe it or not, uh, they, they do um, tend to Bag, the effectiveness of the gas penetration. So for that, uh, Courtney is going to, she's our resident expert on PCDs and in, um, in different packaging aspects as well. So she's gonna take us about that, about packaging loading configuration and PCD selection. All right, thank you, Dania. Um, before we get too far, I just want to put in a little plug and just a reminder that optimizing your sterilization cycle starts as soon as you begin to design your product. If you keep sterilization in mind as you're designing your product, your packaging, et cetera, et cetera, you can make informed decisions that will help you create the most optimal cycle for your product. Today, we'll start off by discussing some key items to consider when designing your device packaging, building your sterilization load. Um, when considering your package, remember that product packaging should be selected in a way to facilitate the sterilization. We're keeping the sterilization in mind all the way at the beginning of the de uh, design. Packaging needs not only to be able to stand up to the conditions of a sterilization process, such as the vacuum and injection phases, uh, temperature, humidity, um, you want to ensure that it can, that the packaging is permeable to humidity and gas. Uh, humidity is important, it acts as a catalyst for the gas to inactivate the microorganisms and is a critical factor in the process. Um, when designing your test, your packaging, keep in mind that you also want to ensure that the packaging can withstand multiple exposures to a sterilization process because it's not an if, but a when, you'll need to re-sterilize your load for one reason or another. Once you've uh, de defined your packaging, the next step is to define what your sterilization load will look like. What is the loading configuration that you intend to validate? There are a couple of options when it comes to, um, to this. Uh, you could validate a standard loading configuration range. For example, um, 100 shipper boxes distributed over four pallets. Or a loading configuration range might be, an example of this might look like 25 shipper boxes on one pallet as your minimum loading configuration to 100 boxes distributed over four pallets as your maximum loading configuration. You might be asking yourself, is it more work to 
validate a range than it is to validate a standard loading configuration? And the short answer is yes. However, doing so does provide flexibility for routine production as the sterilization cycles can fluctuate with production needs and can be of great benefit to your sterilization program. While we're on the topic of a, of a validation range, it is important to remember that the maximum load is not always the appropriate load to use for validation. When evaluating a range, the primary validation activities are based on the load that provides the maximum challenge to sterilization. The maximum challenge or worst case loading configuration is determined by performing a sublethal or a half cycle on both the minimum and maximum loading configurations. These loads are monitored with both BI and temperature and RH sensors. The microbial inactivation and thermodynamic properties of the load are compared to each other to determine the worst case loading configuration. After that's been determined, then you would move forward with your validation activities um, with this worst case or maximum challenge load. When building your load, there are several things to keep in mind, especially when we're trying to always have our sterilization in mind. You don't want to have your loading configuration create unnecessary challenges for the process that result in longer than desired cycle times. Some of those things include permeable wrapping material. The way your load is secured can have significant impact on the overall resistance of the load. For example, if you use standard stretch wrap to secure your load, you may add several layers of a less permeable barrier to the load and this barrier is going to prevent uh, heat transfer, RH transfer, EO transfer into the load and create a harder to sterilize situation. A better solution might be to use a net wrap where the penetration ability does not change, uh, isn't changed by this. And maybe even the best solution would be to use banding. Um, I just take a minute to see how those options can impact the penetrability of the load and create or remove inefficiencies within the sterilization process. Another option is reducing load density. Does this mean you have to sterilize less, less product? No, not necessarily, but you could look at other ways of reducing density like removing paper IFUs. The industry is getting creative with this. Using DVDs or QR codes to communicate instructions could be a great way to reduce the, the density of your, of your load. Um, some other things to consider is layers. Um, adding many layers to a pallet can add resistance to those boxes that are in the central locations. It's harder for EO to get to those locations as it has to travel through through many, many boxes. So in the op if you have options to uh, create chimneys or things like that within your pallet to maximize product contact with, contact with the sterilant, uh, you're setting yourself up for some success with this. Um, now that we've covered the product packaging and loading configurations, let's jump into the pre-validation work. Uh, developing a process challenge device, also known as a PCD. Just a quick refresher. For any of you that aren't familiar with the PCD, essentially it is a surrogate product that has, has demonstrated to be equal or greater in resistance to sterilization than the product that is being sterilized. ISO 11135 states that the resistance of your PCD must be equal to or greater than the resistance of the natural bio burden in the most difficult to sterilize location of the device. As we move through the rest of the section, we'll look at different ways of demonstrating the resistance hierarchy between the PCDs and the products. Before we can talk about alternative methods, let's refresh on the method that has been traditionally used to determine a PCD. A device is inoculated with at least 1 million spores in all the hardest to sterilize locations. We are specifically looking for locations of the device that the sterilant may have a hard time reaching, such as mated surfaces where the gas has to penetrate through material to get to a, to a location, a uh, long lumen that the gas would have to uh, travel through to get to a central or a distal location. The inoculated devices and then the candidate PCDs are exposed side by side to compare the resistance of the BI in the product 
to the resistance of the BI in given PCBs. These results are then used to select an appropriate PCD. Again, we're looking for a PCD that is equal to or greater in resistance than the hardest to sterilize location of the device. What is missing from that last statement? Remember the requirement from ISO, the resistance of your PCD must, equal, must be equal to or greater than the resistance of the natural bio burden in the most difficult to sterilize locations of your device. The alternate methods that we will, will be discussing today ensure that we're focusing on that, on just that, the, the resistance of the natural bio burden. One of the alternate methods is making sure that the microbial load on the BI during the inoculation phase represents the overall microbial load of the product. So then, so rather than inoculating each of those hard to sterilize locations with the 1 million spores, you select a microbial load that best represents the natural bio burden. There may even be instances where it may be appropriate to not inoculate the device at all and only evaluate the resistance of the naturally occurring bio burden on the device. Now you may be saying, this, this girl is crazy. And I tell you, Daniel will attest to that most of the time, but not today. Um, these types of things should be considered when you're looking at your, your PCD selection options. Um, this option may be most appropriate when a device is very simple in nature, a device that is surface sterilization, and the only way you could inoculate, inoculate it is to put a BI in the packaging adjacent to the product. Uh, this would be a good candidate for, for not doing an inoculated product. And so in these cases, as, since there isn't really a hardest to sterilize location, an evaluation of the entire device may be justified. There are some considerations that you want to make, <laughs> sorry, when opting for either of the methods we discussed. First of all, you will want to ensure that you have a good grasp on the bio burden on your device. What this means is that you know what types of organisms and you know how many of them are on an average device. This includes looking at the control of the manufacturing process, making sure that you understand what's being put onto the device and that you're regularly monitoring your routine bio burden. When spikes occur, it may be necessary to do some additional testing to confirm PCD appropriateness. The PCD that's used to monitor the loads for validation or routine processing must meet the requirements of ISO 11135 with regards to devalue and population. But for pre-validation work, justifications can be made to ensure that we're really doing the best that we can to mimic the conditions of our product. In this slide, we're going to take a look at a worst case method for a PCD development. So this would be something that's traditionally done. In this example, the device is inoculated with a million spores in the syringe that is attached to the device. This is done to represent a worst case challenge. However, a configuration like this is going to very likely make the PCD much harder to sterilize than it actually is in turn will have will require a much more robust cycle to kill this PCD. This is just compounded by the fact that it's very unlikely that this device actually has a microbial load even close to that of the BI. So we're really, really making ourselves a hard to sterilize PCD when it comes when we're comparing it to our actual product and product bio burden. In this next example, an alternate we're taking an alternate approach to developing this PCD. It shows a more appropriate means for inoculation. We're not making the device artificially harder to sterilize than it needs to be by choosing a very representative location for our BI. In addition to that, we are taking consideration of what our microbial load on this device is and picking a, a, a microbial load for our BI that is representative of our product. This PCD is a better representation of the device and would yield a much more efficient cycle. As you can see in this slide, it helps us to see how these alternative methods can, 
can impact the efficiency of the sterilization process. This graph depicts what a lethality curve might look like using a gas concentration of let's say 700 milligrams per liter. The blue line out here shows a scenario uh, like we saw in the first example. We have a PCD inoculated in the hardest to sterilize location with a standard BI of at least 1 million spores. Uh, as we change our approach to the PCD, take a look here at the green line, which represents a PCD that has a BI that more closely represents the bio burden on the device. And then the red line indicates the resistance of the natural occurring bio burden on the device. As you can see, we are getting closer and closer to really representing our product as we really take a look at how these PCDs are designed. As you could see from that graph, choosing or designing the most appropriate PCD for the job can significantly impact the lethality obtained from a given cycle. But how does this contribute to the overall effort of optimizing a cycle and reducing gas consumption? To answer this question, let's refresh on the critical parameters of an EO cycle. Time, temperature, RH, and gas concentration. So with less resistant PCD, we can target any one or combination of those parameters to optimize the cycle. Since there is an industry, since there is an industry push to reduce EO concentrations, let's focus our attention there. As you can see from this altered graph, we are looking at a gas concentration of 250 milligrams per liter. We have the same PCDs and product that we had in our first graph. When using a PCD that most closely represents the product, there is potential to re reach the same 10 to the minus six SAL in the same exposure time that we did with, when validating a PCD that is harder to sterilize using traditional methods. In conclusion, we have learned that although these alter alternative methods for PCD development require more bio burden control and monitoring, Designing or finding the PCD that most closely represents the product will contribute significantly to the greater efforts of EO reduction and cycle optimization. Once the PCDs are determined, the next step is to validate a cycle. Here to talk to you about the different validation approaches and some ideas on how to create the most effective sterilization parameters, let me turn the time back over to our sterilization expert, Dania Cortez. Thank you, Courtney. Um, up to this point, we, we've learned the importance of having the appropriate PCD. And we'll put it all together at the end, but just keep that in mind as we're talking about on how to validate the cycle, either by the overkill method or using alternative approaches. In this webinar, we want to uh, walk you through a couple of examples using an, an, a different approach than, than overkill. And that's what we're gonna focus our attention on today. We're not going to talk about the half cycle overkill a lot um, as this is well characterized. We feel that it's, it's um, important for us a better use of our time to talk about how to do one using a cycle calculation approach or a BI bio burden combined method approach. So with that said, if you are unfamiliar and you want to get yourself more familiarized with these different approaches, um, ISO 11135, the 2014 version, Annex is AMB, gives a good content on these different approaches. Um, and just as a quick summary, just as a refresher, the, there's, this standard talks about the overkill and the BI, bio burden combined method. The overkill, you can do it two ways. You can do it through a cycle calcula calculation approach or you can do it through a half cycle approach. If you remember right, your, your half cycle approach, you perform three half cycles after you have determined the time and you just you, you are just confirming this, this process uh, parameters that you already have established previously. Cycle calculation is pretty similar in the sense that you still have to show a 12 spore log reduction. That is, that's why it's called overkill, because you still have to show that much, um, that, that you have to travel that much to get to a good a sterility assurance level. Now, the BI bioburden method, it's actually, it's based on the same concept. You still have to show on a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus six. 
nevertheless, the difference is that this method allows you to start at a different starting point. Instead of starting at a population of a million, you are going to start at a population that is representative of your product. Um, this method can be used either using graded BI, population BIs, or it can be used by grading the, the time, by changing the, the time of your cycle exposures, AKA by performing fractional cycles. Um, there is an alternate method as well. It's just the absolute bio burden. This one is described on Amy TIR 16. However, if you are going to um, distribute product in a different country that it's not United States, you might want to check with your regulatory body if this is accepted over there as well. Um, but it is out there if you if you are wanting to do even a shorter cycle or wanted to not use ABI as a monitor. This one is definitely harder. And I don't know of many companies that use an absolute bio burden method. Um, uh, so just, just for your information, we just talk about it. Now, just real quickly, um, this is a comparison of the different approaches. Um, again, you have your half cycle approach. The first two are still overkill, believe it or not. Um, half cycle and cycle calculation are, are described again in 11.135. The difference is that your cycle calculation, it will, it might give you a significantly shorter cycle. Um, it, the, it, the difference here too is that your bio burden becomes more significant on your cycle calculation and even most significant on your BI bio burden approaches. And, and how do you accomplish this? Well, you, you're gonna have to understand what's in your product. You have to characterize the bio burden load over time not just a one-time point where you're validating your product, but you're gonna have to do it more often as minimum as quarterly or as often as monthly, depending on which method you use. That's why it's more expensive because you'll have to do more testing um, on the buy burden um, uh, load. Um, it can also be more expensive because you might have to do more fractional cycles than just the three half cycles or four half cycles that you're required to do on the half cycle approach. So. That's, that's the main difference amongst all, all of them. Now, why is overkill so widely used? Well, this one has been the, the method that has, it, it, it's been the top choice in, in the industry, and that's because it's the easiest one. You don't have to perform different cycles to estimate your time. You can just estimate your time in different ways based on the loading configuration or based on the PCD that you're using. Um, it doesn't require much bio burden information because you're you're aiming for killing everything. Um, it's well understood. It's accepted by almost everybody. In fact, up to a few um, a few years ago, two to three years ago, you would still have to face scrutination, or you would have to justify on why you're doing a different cycle approach that it was in the half cycle approach. Um, just again, because it wasn't so understood and it wasn't so accepted. Now, because of the challenges that we're facing with with um, watching our ethylene oxide uh, consumption, we we need to be more responsible and and we need to understand this more um, different approaches. And I have seen uh, an increased acceptance from the regulatory bodies when by doing a different one. So that's the good news there. Um, and then again, three half cycles, you have to use a, a PCD that's uh, at least 10 to the six. Now, whoa, why did it close? Let's go over the cycle calculation approach. Um, so the, the way that this is, please don't feel, I hope you're not feeling overwhelmed when, when, we, we, when we say, uh, when we talk about these alternative alternative um, approaches, they they are really based on the same principle. So let's go through them. Um, you have any questions? Type them in our chat. Hopefully, we'll we'll get to them all. But um, uh, it's it's it, it might be daunting at first, and the concept might be hard to understand at first. Nevertheless, um, it's I, I promise it's it's it gets easier as you apply these concepts. So cycle calculation approach. The way that you do this is you are going to take your load and you're going to expose it at different cycles. 
You can also use different BIs with different populations if you'd rather keep the cycle time constant. Um, you can do so as well. I personally like performing different, varying the time on, on, my, on my cycle calculation instead of the population. But then again, you can do either one. Um, so the reason why you do this is you want to build your microbial decay curve. You want to you wanna build that curve that Courtney just showed earlier. And we're going to show you one more a little uh, in, in a couple of minutes here. But that's the purpose of that. You want to build your microbial decay curve, right? You don't want to just assume a straight line with the half cycle approach. Now, um, once you have run those fractional cycles, then you determine the D value of the load. Now here you can do it in, you can take two different approaches here as well. You can use, you can use the uh, different um, calculations that are aimed to give you a D value on the fraction negative of the curve. Or you can use a different calculation and that's direct enumeration and that's aimed to give you data on the positive side of the curve or on the on the direct um, enumeration, that's the direct enumeration approach. Now, how many BIs are you gonna use in your load? That depends on which method you use to, you wanna choose. For instance, if you want to use the Holcomb Spearman Carver method, you have to do a minimum of five exposures, and you have to show that one of those exposures um, have all BIs growing. You wanna show two fractional with growth and two with all no growth. Right, and you have to use a minimum of 20 BIs per cycle. On the contrary, if you want to use the Stumber Murphy Cochrane, then you use a minimum of 50 BIs per run, but you only need to have three runs in the fractional negative range. Um, some people get lucky and get it right on the first three fractional cycles, and then you're done. Um, but some people would like the, the, the would like to have the additional confidence that the Holcomb and Spearman Carver method gives you by giving you a confidence interval. That's the main difference between the two. That you get a confidence interval with one, you can get a confidence interval with the other, but you're required to do a little bit more math in there. Um, and and also with the other one, you get to have less cycles if needed. So so you run your cycles. Uh, you calculated the D value, and now you get to um, take that and extrapolate to get your routine cycle time. The way that you do that is by multiplying, and, or really by adding, summing, that's the sum, really, that's the right mathematical term. You sum it to your um, spore lock reduction. So I have, um, I have a few formulas here for, um, for the different the value calculation methods. This is in 11.138. As you get familiar with the value calculation methods, you just pull the standard and it goes through the derivation of all these um, formulas and it gives you the number of BIs. It, 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 it gives you everything you need to select the correct the value calculation approach. Um, so, all right. Let's, let's go through an example and let's go through a step-by-step -step method. So you're, you want to use the, the cycle calculation approach. First step, you perform your fractional cycles with your IPCD. You build your decay curve and the number of BIs will depend on the method that you selected to, of the D value. Once you run those, you, take, you calculate the D value and after that you will, you need to calculate the minimum uh, spore re log reduction. Because this is overkill, you will always have to do a, a 12, a, a, spore lock, a spore lock reduction of 12, because you are looking at a 10 to the minus 6, right? For any sterility um, claim, we'll have to show a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus 6, which is a probability of one survivor organism in a million, right? So that's, that's, that's based on the standard. Um, we'll, we'll go from there. Now, don't get me started on where did that come from? Where did the one in a million uh, come from, right? But that, that's, that's a different topic. Um, is it appropriate? Is it too much? I'm on the, on the less conservative side that believes that 10 to the minus 6 sterility assurance level is too much. However, that's what we do in the industry for sterilization. So because you have to go down there to the 10 to the minus six uh, zone on your kill curve, um, we, you end up with, an with a spore lock reduction of 12. 
and that's because you're starting with a population of one in a million. Um, you take, okay, so you calculate your lead value and then you calculate your minimum uh, spore log reduction, which in this case is 12. Now you will take that lead value from step two and you're gonna um, sum it with step three. And that will be the minimum exposure time for your full cycle. Now that you have the time, you are to run a confirmatory cycle. That's your full cycle. That's where you prove your, your PPQ on your validation. That's, this is where you get your residuals. This is where you get your temperature, humidity data, um, and all, all the stuff that we need to, to use. So I have an example here. Um, in this case, we chose the standard Murphy Cochrane uh, devalue calculation. We exposed the load at the two different cycle times, and each one of them had a different uh, result on, on BI's growing and no growing. Um, the devalue calculation using that formula that I just showed you is a 12, 11, 13. Um, if, um, I, I, I think I got the wrong numbers here, but just picture here that it's 12, 11, and 13, and then you get the average of that. Your average devalue comes out to be at about um, 12. So you take that 12 devalue um, and multiply it by your spore log reduction, that gives you a cycle time of 144 minutes. So that's very simple. As, as I know it sounds simpler than it will be because getting fractional cycle, fractional growth sometimes is a challenge. But on the math end, it's, it's not more complicated than, than that. Just, just multiplying the, the SLR by the devalue, by the average devalue, and you're there. Now, some people, um, they, they want to include an additional confidence um, interval. So they actually calculate the standard deviation and then just add it to this calculation um, to, your, to their, so, their cycle time. And that's doable as well. I've seen as much as three standard deviations added to this time. So that's, again, somebody that wants to be more, uh, more conservative. All right, now let's talk about the BI bioburden approach. Really, this, this is really based on the same principle. Um, you will, the difference is that you will start on your curve at a different population meaning you don't get, you don't have to come all the way and show your 10 to the minus six sterilization level from a starting population of a million. You actually start at a hundred or a thousand depending on where your bio burden is. The main concept for this approach is, is that you have to understand your bio burden. You have to have uh, levels and you have to have controls. As you're manufacturing your devices, um, bio burden control is crucial, right? Because this is not a, this approach is not meant for a manufacturer to just do the testing at one time point right before the validation. It's meant for manufacturers that understand the bio burden over time, that they know how it changes seasonally. Um, and and this, this is pretty, pretty important to understand. So if you are at this level, if you understand your bio burden, um, the next step for this uh, validation approach is, is to do pretty much the same thing that you did on the cycle calculation approach. Um, you are going to, you can either use uh, different times for your fractional cycles, or you can use different BI titers for, for those cycles. And then this is, this is what I was talking about earlier. Your SLR, you still have to show a 10 to the minus six sterility assurance level. Nevertheless, because you're starting at a different point, because you're starting at 100 by a burden, you only need a spore log reduction of eight instead of a 12. Um, that's, that's the difference, and that's the beauty of this, of this approach. All right, I hope, I hope you're all following. Um, we'll go through step-by-step -step, uh, method, same thing. Step number one, you run your cycles on your IPCD. You choose a devalue calculation method. Once you have it, you're gonna sum it to, the only additional step here is that you're gonna get the log of your bio burden and you're gonna sum it to the log of your sterility assurance level. And you multiply the devalue from step two with that, that from step one to the step two from that calculation that you just did and you get your time and you just run a confirmatory cycle. Here's a, another example. Your devalue was 
after you run all three cycles, Thermomorphic Cochrane, you get a 5.5 D value. Um, your vibrant is a thousand. So the log of that thousand, you're gonna you're gonna sum that to your sterility assurance level or your log reduction, which is a 10 to the minus six. So that gives you a positive six, um, and I'm, I'll call it right here. Um, so that that gives you a, a, a spore log reduction of nine. So you take that spore log reduction, multiply it by your D value, and this is your exposure cycle time. Um, yep, and that's that's as simple as it's simple as that. Um, this table just shows you a, a, just a comparison approach, the number of cycles that you have to do, the number of BIs. Um, one thing that I like to point out here is that you don't think half cycle on, on these three different approaches. The only time that you think half cycle is in your overkill half cycle approach. I get questions from clients sometimes that say, okay, so now I have my time from the fractional cycle. So now, why run a half cycle, right? Like, no, no, you go straight to your full cycle to your P to show your PPQ um, parameters that you need to show for the validation. So just remember that. All right, this is my favorite slides of all. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. If you choose a BI bio burden, you get to start at a different point of the curve to show your curve decay to get to a 10 to the minus six sterile assurance level, right? So your, your log reduction is going to be your six that are on your negative side of the curve, seven and eight. That's your, your, your log uh, reduction, right? As opposed to the half cycle where you have to assume a million organisms in your device, right? So then you're starting over here, then your log reduction is a whole 12 log decay. Um, that's that's a lot, right? So that this is this is where I I like the BI vibrant method. Now, let's talk about the cycle calculation. So cy this one is the cycle enumeration. This the value was calculated based on the positive side of the curve, right? Because you're you're dealing with survivor organisms. This one is on the fraction negative uh, side of the curve because you are dealing with probabilities. You're on the quantum zone right here for your d value calculation. The slope of your line is going to be different, and this is what the d value is telling you, right? So the, your your cycle calculation is giving you the slope. That is um, the resistance. This is how quickly your organisms are going to die. So by having a more accurate d value, a more accurate slope of this curve, then you don't end up with a very long slide. Just picture a slide. You, when you go to the park. And, and you have like the longest, more uh, stretchy slide in the park, and you take forever to go down. Um, I don't know what's happening there. Um, you take forever to go down on a slide in the park that, is, that the slope is so long, right? But you have a, a more inclined slope, a shorter slide, boom, you're there. It's the exact same concept. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's what the devalue gives us um, on, on these approaches. All right. So, for just to conclude on this, on this, uh, on this, on the validation approaches, um, by having a different and half cycle approach, we will, we might, we we will increase the cycle efficiency. I I, I don't want to say my, I don't want to say will either, but I'm pretty sure, and data shows that you may have a shorter amount cycle and then a, a better efficient cycle. Um, in order for you to, to reach this level, you have to have more knowledge on the Viber then. Um, and by knowing these two, cycle reduction will be significant. Um, and then again, putting it all together, this is why having a right, the right PCD is crucial, right? Because it doesn't matter if you calculate a, a, a great cycle on, on, on BI by burden, or you calculate a good on um, a, an amazing cycle on the cycle calculation approach. If your PCD is all the way over here, right next to your overkill, it doesn't really matter. You won't be able to kill your PCD if you once you calculate a time that is shorter than what you did. So again, a, a plot to, to, to do different alternatives to show your PCD. All right, I hope that that wasn't too much um, for, for us to grasp. Now, um, this next section, um, 
it's the, we, we wanted to talk about a little bit on sterilization parameters. And, and really we wanted to do this to set the stage for our next um, day webinar. That's next week on Thursday where uh, Mike and Russ are gonna take us a little bit more on how to optimize the cycle that is already there. And they're gonna touch more on this, on how to, to change certain parameters to get us a, a good, um, a reliable cycle. So we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Uh, what I did wanted to mention this week, and uh, just again to set the, the stage, is that um, just, just to remind you to, to bring us back to, to, to the basics of this, right? Your main parameters. Uh, just go back to remember what the main parameters, what the intention of the combination of these par main parameters are. Um, and that's your gas concentration, your relative humidity, temperature, and time. All this together aim to help the EO, the ethylene oxide molecules, to reach and have a better contact with your product, right? So, um, and there's lots of literature out there on how gas concentration and temperature plateaus at certain, after a certain time and after a certain con uh, concentration and, a, and at a certain um, uh, degrees because really more doesn't mean better. Um, so yeah, so you, you go back to your main parameters. If you have a product that it's temperature sensitive or it's humidity sensitive um, and you cannot really do much with this or if you have already maximized these four, there are additional parameters that can help you and can, can actually increase the EO penetration to the device for a better contact. And that's, that's what we're gonna be talking about and doing more of this. But these additional parameters you can use to your advantage and help create different dynamics in the cycle to help with um, an additional um, microbial destruction. So um, as an example of those are, are you're doing dynamic conditioning as opposed to a static, um, dwell time or doing some actually dynamic evacuation as well. Some sterilizers have the capability to add steam or our um, water molecules at the end of the cycle during the uh, tri aeration phase. Um, and we have a, a, on the slides, we have a, a couple of, a few parameters again that, that, that can help you there. If you're gonna do preconditioning, you know, are you, are you doing a cold star? Are you, um, are you looking in, in dew points and condensation on your load, making sure that it doesn't get too wet, right? So it, it better penetrates, uh, so EO better attaches to the molecules when it's in the chamber. Again, temperature, uh, temperature is a big, a big win. If you are running low and your temperature and your device is not temperature sensitive, we, this is the first time where, well, this is where we, the first thing we look at, um, different temperatures I use for different phases. Uh, your initial evacuation, uh, deeper vacuums are gonna give give better performance because it's going to help the EO molecules to reach your difficult difficult to sterilize location. Uh, conditioning, uh, dynamic conditioning. This is I'm a big fan of this one. Uh, water molecules are an excellent catalyzer for EO molecules to uh, to help facilitate and facilitate their diffusion. Um, again, if you are able to do combine these two, some um, um, dynamic uh, vacuums and air flashes in this in this uh, phase that are gonna give you a, a good and efficient cycle. Uh, gas, concentra gas concentration, I know it seems uh, counterintuitive, uh, but, but more gas is not always proportional to more lethality. And we'll talk about that next week a little more. Same with time. Um, this this is this came back came from all the validation work that you did earlier, right? From the different approaches. Instead of having a 700 minute cycle, you now have a very efficient, uh, lower amounts of time on this cycle. So so this is what is going to pay off. And again, post vacuum, you can use some some dynamic uh, vacuums there. Um, and that is it. Hopefully, you endured through all that, and now you can feel that you're able to understand these concepts a little more, you can go back to your coworkers and tell them you learn all about different approaches for validations other than half cycle. 
And um, I believe, uh, Mike, are you take over? Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Dania and Courtney, both of you, for your insights today and all this uh, valuable information about uh, ethylene oxide sterilization. Uh, we do have some time for some questions, so we're just going to jump right into those. So uh, I'll, I'll put the first question out there for, for either you, Dania, or Courtney. Uh, the first one is, how would you go about determining what the microbial load should be on my device? Yeah, so to determine what your microbial load should be on the BI when inoculating your device, you'll want to take a look at the resistance of, or I'm sorry, the counts on the bio burden. You want something that's going to be pretty uh, equivalent, maybe still even a little harder to sterilize. And remember that when we're working with a MRO or most resistant organism, you will get some uh, hard, working with the psilocytrophius will be harder than sterilizing most of the organisms you're gonna find on your devices. So if you have a normal bio burden level of 100 organisms per device, you may look at using a BI that's inoculated with 10 to the four um, or 10 to the three to still have a little bit uh, higher bio or higher microbial challenge, but more representative of your bio burden. Great, thanks, Courtney. Uh, on to our next question. Can we optimize our cycle and continue to use the overkill approach? Good question. Um, yes, yes, definitely you can. Uh, in fact, that's, that's uh, what we're gonna, that we're gonna talk about next week. Um, you already have a validated cycle, you already have a PCD, how can we Sorry, um, it's, hopefully that's better. But yeah, the, the answer is yes, you can. And we're gonna talk about that next week. Um, our friends with uh, Adsterogenics are gonna take on this and gonna show, you, show us how we can still use the same validation perform and just be able to optimize those parameters. Great, thanks, Tanya. Uh, our next question is, what if I already have a validated cycle and I want to optimize it? Where should I start? Yeah, so that's that's really another uh, segue question into next week. That's what Mike and Russ are going to talk to us about is we have a validated cycle. What do I look like and where can we create those efficiencies? So make sure if you're not registered for next week's webinar that you uh, get registered. Great. So here's our next question. If the bio burden is found to suddenly increase its resistance or devalue, what happens to validation status and cycle development status? That is a great question. So because in several of these alternative approaches, we are so heavily reliant on the bio burden of the device. Um, if you do find to have a spike in bio burden or resistance, the first thing that you'll want to evaluate is to make sure that with these new, um, with this new count or new load of microbial on the device, your PCDs are still adequate. Um, so that would look like a uh, where we're evaluating the resistance of the natural bio burden. Um, against the PCDs to ensure that there's nothing on there that's going to be harder to sterilize. Now, in most cases, you'll probably find that your PCD is still harder to sterilize if you chose a good microbial load in your initial uh, study. Um, if not, that's when you would need to take that back to look at your validation as well. Thank you, Courtney. On to the next question. Why should bioburden be monitored quarterly? Is that in the ISO standard? Oh, that's a good question. Really, there are not requirements or guidelines for 
bioburden monitoring for ethylene oxide. There, there are, there's a lot of that for radiation, but not for ethylene oxide. Really, quarterly, it's, it's a, a recommendation that it's used by some um, out there in the industry. We, we really think that if you're going to use an absolute bioburden method, that should be monitored perhaps a little more often than that. But quarterly would just give you an idea of seasonal changes. It might give you an idea of employees uh, changing if you have a clean room and, and through just to help you understand that. Uh, but no, there's, there's unfortunately not specific guidance out there. This is just for you to, um, the minimum for you to understand that bio burden over time and, and to just take into account different changes. Perfect, thanks, Tanya. We have time for one, maybe two questions. So here's the next one. If you validate a min and a max load for a device, is everything in between validated? Yeah, so that's so the intention of that is we're sort of bracketing all of the loading configuration and ranges in between. So as long as we do a good job on identifying the worst case loading configuration on those extremes, uh, then you, the, the answer would be, yeah, that is the intention of doing it that way. Okay, thanks, Dania, and, and thank you, Courtney. Um, we're about out of time, um, but we want to thank you all for attending this webinar, and we want to thank Dania and Courtney uh, for sharing this information with us. Um, uh, as you see on the screen there, Nelson Labs and Sterogenics both have, have a lot of valuable resources for you. Uh, you can find many webinars, videos, articles. Uh, again, uh, we do hope to get back to doing live uh, seminars here in the future. We have white papers and, and obviously trade shows at some point as well. Um, there's the information and where you can find all of these resources. Again, as a reminder, this is a two-part series. Um, you can, you'll be able to access the recording of this webinar session um, later uh, in about uh, three to four days on the nelsonlabs.com website under the education tab um, and on demand's webinar. And if you haven't registered already for day two, which will take place at the same time next Thursday, February 25th, we have two time slots available, 10 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. Eastern. We invite you to register for that as well. Um, again, if you have any additional questions or we didn't get to some of your questions, you can certainly contact uh, the presenters or you can contact our, our sales team at sales at nelsonlabs.com and they can, get in con they can help get you in contact with uh, presenters. Again, we want to thank you all for attending today. We have, hope that you have a great rest of your day.